It's really my great pleasure now and honor to introduce the luncheon speaker. In January of 2018, the standing of Harvard University ascended when Philip J. Deloria departed from the University of Michigan and settled into his role as professor of history at Harvard, the first full professor who is Native American at Harvard. It only took a few centuries there. That's really, just think the next four centuries what might happen there. Um, while we would never want to accuse either Harvard or the University of Michigan of theft, it is an indisputable fact that this upsurge in good fortune for those two institutions was ours before it was theirs. Phil Deloria received his bachelor's in music education degree from the University of Colorado in 1982. Wanting to observe and understand humanity from many different angles, he then taught band at a Denver Metro high school. Having observed high school music uh, performance to satisfaction, he then returned to CU for an MA in journalism and mass com communication. That was back when we at CU could remember what to call that program before it became an acronym that comes out different every time I try to say it. So by one of Providence's most gracious acts of kindness to me, Phil took my Western American history course, which I believe then was called the early or the not so early American frontier as part of his journalism program. In that course, the first assignment required students to write an autobiographical essay about a Western adventure they had experienced. The assignment launched me on a Western adventure of my own. I had, I think, 50 students enrolled in the class, but I ended up with 51 papers. So, I pored over the class registration list, comparing the names there with the names of students who had submitted papers. This did not solve the mystery, but it did give it a little more definition. A person named Hank Gomez had turned in a paper, a particularly lively paper, I should note, but something had gone awry with Hank Gomez's relationship with the university bureaucracy, and his name did not appear on the course list. Well, you have probably figured out where this is going. From time to time, as a student, Phil Deloria doubled his workload. He would write an impressive and very capable paper and submit it as the work of Phil Deloria. And then he would write a very different version of the paper, colorful, informal, irreverent, contrarian, full of vitality and improbability, and submitted it that as the work of Hank Gomez. I thought that Harvard already, Harvard has it on their website or something. Don't, well, no. <laughs> no, it does not, it's not on Harvard's website. No, uh, Shelley Lowe, I think, told me that it was. Well, anyway, okay, moving on. Um, but it's now public record. That's good. Um, what is also public record is that Hank Gomez and Phil Deloria were, in my opinion, both A students. But I never suggested that Hank Gomez apply to the Yale American Studies PhD program. Still, I did write a letter of recommendation for Phil Deloria. A week ago, I had a sudden archival impulse to find the recommendation, recommendation letter I wrote some three decades ago, but Phil will now sigh with relief to learn that I did not find the time to perform this exercise in pack rat resource management. <laughs> and now I'm cutting off reminiscence and moving fast to get out of the way and let Phil Deloria, perhaps with the assistance of Hank Gomez, stand before you. <laughs> but first, Phil Deloria is the author of two remarkable and influential books, both with a rare combination of intricacy and clarity, original insight and grounded common sense, Plain Indian, published in 1998, and Indians in Unexpected Places, published in 2004. Most recently, he has published an unsettling and dazzling book, Becoming Mary Sully, Toward an American Indian Abstract, bringing well-deserved and long-delayed attention to an extraordinary Indian artist who was also his great aunt, and in that cause, also widening and deepening our understanding of what that means, American Indian art. Continuing his quest to observe human nature in unlikely and illuminating settings, Phil has served as president of the American Studies Association, and he will be the president of the Organization of American Historians in 2022. <clears throat> I see this as quite direct continuity from the band teaching experience, where he will be uh, doing field work at the Organization of American Historian, chairing that board and noting that there was quite a bit more harmony at work in the high school band classes than there sometimes is in those, True. those circles. 
Phil is also a trustee of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian, where he chairs the, repatri the Repatriation Committee, a role of public service that seems to be something of a family tradition. It was in that world where Vine got us all writing articles about white men's hats in American history. So I don't know what route you'll take in that, but I know it will be creative, and Hank Gomez will be a co-author probably. At the University of Michigan, Phil Deloria served as Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, where he was as much an innovator in teaching and pedagogy and mentorship of the young as he has been in research and public engagement. He is relentlessly and unstoppably interdisciplinary. Whenever he encounters an area of specialization that offers a route to understanding, he instantly incorporates that area of specialization into his world and introduces it to other areas of special specialization that have been waiting for decades to get to know each other. And finally, Phil Deloria is the son of Vine Deloria, Jr. He and I uh, had a memorable, for me, very memorable. You might just have these every day for all I know. But we were at the Yale Art Gallery, and we were giving talks on a panel about an exhibit on Western American art that was at the Yale Art Gallery. And in our audience, unknown to us when we began speaking, uh, was the goofiest white lady that any of us had ever encountered. So the goofiest white lady uh, put herself on record very fast in the question and answer period. She got up, she was very outraged. She looked us up, looked us at the panel, and she said she thought it was unconscionable and intolerable that Yale University would have a session on Western American art without a Native American participating. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I, I was not her fan, we'll say that. I was not her fan and will not become that. And I didn't know what to do, and I thought maybe he is a former student, maybe I would move into the breach there. But then I saw this masterful taking on of that challenge. Uh, Phil said to the white lady's considerable bewilderment, he said, we, this is a little bit of a paraphrase, he said, we can't be absolutely certain on the dates here, but sometime uh, probably in the, in the 17th century, French traders named Delorier came into the area that we now know as North Dakota. And this lady has got a, well, what has this got to do with anything? And then he then <laughs> moves along, and that is indeed uh, a story of his origins. And it, uh, she shut up really fast. And I, I don't recall her joining us at the reception, so that was fine too. But she's a smarter woman today. Uh, we know that. So all of us here today are lucky beyond any possible estimation to hear the talk that Phil Deloria is about to give on his father and his father's lively and long-lived book, Custer Died for Your Sins. Phil Deloria. Thanks, Patty. <laughs> Well, I'm so happy to be in this room of uh, extraordinary people um, generously gathered together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Custer Died for Your Sins. Gloria May, my former colleague here at Colorado, and I were just talking about the morning sessions, and we both confessed to a certain set of, uh, of kind of emotional moments, right, as we were sort of remembering this book and, and remembering my dad. And I definitely had a few of those going, and I suspect there will be a few, a few others. So I'm grateful to all of you for coming here today to the Center for the American West, uh, the University of Colorado Law School, the Native American Indigenous Studies Program um, for hosting the celebration, Patty for putting it all together and for that most generous uh, and revealing introduction. <laughs> <clears throat> I feel uh, I can't begin without a couple of prefatory notes. First, I want to bring you both regrets and appreciation from my mother. We were both hoping that she'd be able to be here today, but she had her second knee replacement just over a month ago. And while she's doing fine, in fact, doing great, uh, she decided it was a little too early for her to start traveling around. So greetings and thanks to you from her, from my brother Dan, my sister Jeannie, uh, and the extended Deloria family. Second, I want to say a word about humility. Humility, uh, as Faith mentioned earlier, is a great Dakota virtue. And as I tell my students, it's actually the precondition for all knowledge. To be humble is to admit uh, not only our ignorance and thus the possibility of our learning, but also the possibility of other perspectives and other possibilities, things we might debate, discuss. So I knew my dad as a son knows a father. Um, I knew him as a colleague here at the University of Michigan as he was closing out his academic career. Um, as I was beginning mine, we were just down the hall. And actually, in his last semester of teaching, we shared the same office. Convenient <laughs> thing for the chair of the department to be able to do when we were short offices was to ask us to share. I've known him as an intellectual figure as I've studied his writings, and I've known him, of course, in other ways as well. But my knowledge is partial. 
Others of you have known him through different experiences as a teacher and collaborator, as a close colleague, as a mentee or mentor, as the subject of, this, of detailed historical analysis, as a friend, as an inspiration, um, as an author that you've read. Vine Deloria was a complicated man, um, active in many different spheres of life. Um, uh, Patty, quite complimentary, saying that I, I'm interdisciplinary, but he was much more interdisciplinary than me. Even here at Colorado, he had appointments in political science, religious studies, law, um, ethnic studies, history, um, and probably a few others that I can't even, uh, can't even quite remember. Um, I never fail to learn something new uh, about him when I meet people who knew him or who've engaged his work, and so I want to thank everyone here for sharing the learning. Third caveat about intellectual sovereignty, as Robert Warrior frames it, is a practice in which Native critics can and should engage one another with more vigor and energy than in the past, with sincere engagement and a willingness to ask tough questions. So I'm going to say is maybe a piece of heresy, Custer Died for Your Sins is a great book, a world historical book. It's not a perfect book, though, right? Its greatness derives from the, article, uh, the arguments it's advanced about self-determination, relationality, responsibility, for the ways it catalyzed a moment and a set of possibilities, particular style and voice that I think it modeled for those who, who came after. All these things, right, are super important about this book. But to see and to name and discuss and perhaps even to joke about its imperfections and ambiguities is not actually a sign of disrespect, right? These things, I think, are gifts that any book gives us, right? And we need to embrace those gifts. We do so with humility, right, and with respect. But I think that kind of engagement measures a sort of respect that my father would actually appreciate. He was, after all, a guy who did not shy away from a tussle, who made genial verbal combat part of the dinner table as we were growing up, and who competed at uh, Monopoly with the ferocity of a Marine, which he was and which he was proud of, to the point where he would bring my brother and sister and I to tears um, as we were playing, and he was gleefully destroying us. Um, <clears throat> And I do feel it incumbent, since so many people have told stories about, about his uh, relationship to the telephone, just to do one of my own, which is that my favorite, maybe one of my favorite moments um, was when my dad, who loved the film The Godfather and watched it many, many times. He'd watch a film a lot of times before he would sit down to write at night. He would watch The Godfather over and over and over again. Um, on the weekend that my wife and I got married, uh, <clears throat> he recorded this message on our answering machine. Father's wedding. <laughs> if you come to me before, even now, the scum who did this to your daughter will be suffering this very day. <laughs> <laughs> and that really captures some essence of him, right? As a, as a prankster, as a guy with an incredible sense of humor. Well, enough of that. For American Indian people of his generation and those close in time, Custer Died for Your Sins was a critical and sometimes the critical catalyzing text for an indigenous political consciousness. At the same time, it also called out to a non-native audience with a critical voice and a demand for accountability and action. Five, day, uh, five decades later, it is still relevant. Um, and we can begin with some of the obvious reasons, some of which were already talked about this morning. The book codified and institutionalized a biting American Indian critique of anthropology, one that generated sessions at the American Anthropological Association, a delicious defensiveness on the part of Margaret Mead, who kind of freaked out, <laughs> collections of commentary, uh, and in the end, as we heard this morning, a real transformation of that discipline. It may be the book's most visible contribution, although perhaps not its most significant, but visible. At the same time, one might also argue that it accelerated the decline of an already fading Christian church in Indian affairs, a tradition that had been dominant for over a century, largely, but I should say not entirely, to the detriment of Indian people. It was consistent with a long tradition of Native people's skewering of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but the book took that pummeling to new heights and a new audience. And it was an ethnic bestseller in a moment when no Indian texts had a voice in that market. Paired with Scott Mamaday's House Made of Dawn, it marked 1969 as a moment of native presence to be followed by Alcatraz and then by the American Indian Movement, Wounded Knee, and everything after. In 1969, white Americans, arguably black Americans and other Americans, saw native people in their face in ways that were new to the 20th century. Many of the reviews and the writings surrounding Custer framed my father as the young radical voice of red power, and that's how the story is often told and remembered. 
Um, one of the reviews, strikingly, for those of us who like the American West and study this, Edward Abbey reviewed this in the New York Times. Reading the book now, one is struck by a very different configuration of radicalism, conservatism, and problem solving visible in the book. When I say conservatism, put it in scare quotes and think of it in the context of the present moment, I think, Dan, as you were talking about. In a 1975 interview with Studs Terkel, my father framed himself a bit apart as being newly sympathetic to the young radicals. He was frustrated at the failure of the federal government to respond to the 20 points. That was the document authored by native intellectual Hank Adams that accompanied the trail of broken treaties, which emphasized the renewal of treaty rights and the restoration of treaty relationships. And he was more frustrated by what he saw as the failures of tribal councils and national Indian organizations to really press home that argument, and thus the new sympathy. Reading Custer in that light, one might recognize what came before that sympathy, that he was not exactly a young radical in the sense that we oftentimes think of it, but he was in many ways a fundamentally institutional person. He claimed no membership in the American Indian Movement, AIM, uh, though he provided strategy and testimony at the Wounded Knee Trials. He seems to have paid dues to the National Indian Youth Council, but wasn't all that closely associated with most of its members or the strategies of its young intellectuals and activists. Indeed, he rather consistently, and in this book, named the National Congress of American Indians, the NCAI, uh, and tribal governments as the best, most active, and most hopeful institutions for the future. At the conclusion of his 1971 edition of Red Men in the New World Drama, he actually provides a list of the major Indian groups at work today. One finds the same gesture in Custer, and he encouraged readers in this to go and pr promote and, and uh, support these particular groups. Well, I think there's nothing illogical about this. He grew up in the shadow of the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, which helped create a culture of politics around tribal councils, and of the NCAI working to beat back the termination policies of the 1950s and 60s, which sought to eliminate those tribal governments. So contra the critiques sometimes offered by the National Indian Youth Council, Native American Youth Council, um, tribal councils and national organizations seem to him capable and competent or at least potentially so, or at least mostly so, once you understood the dynamics of Indian leadership and how you might navigate it. He had a powerful faith in the future of Indian people. And tribalism, or tribal nationalism, I think was one of the, the sort of cornerstone bases for that faith. He contrasted tribalism with militancy, and he framed it as the more challenging and ultimately the more productive route. He recommended tribal nationalism to African-American activists. He criticized hippies and counterculturalists for narcissistic vision that got it completely wrong. He was even willing on occasion to actually praise counterculturalists for getting it kind of right, right. He had an open mind right, on this particular kind of question. He even tried to see, as we heard earlier, in a, in a somewhat labored and I think unconvincing analogy, the corporation as a modern form of tribalism, failing, um, we should note, to launch the sort of uh, requisite critique of you know, late capital and profit under conditions of late capitalism. Um, although I think, Dan, I think you're right that this was an open question for him and an interesting and intriguing one. Um, it seems to me he was, he was perhaps interested in a slightly different question, right, about the kinds of rights that might be held by collective entities and how we might think about those in bigger and broader terms. His definitions of tribal nationalism were sometimes usefully um, imprecise. Clearly it rested on native status as distinct nations in relationship to other governments. That's a bit of the nationalism. Another bit of the nationalism came out of his conviction that Indian people had distinct, and I want to em emphasize this, superior, right? Distinct and superior forms of self-governance, social relations, cultural production. And those forms, crucially, were tribal, right? Relational, interdependent, responsible, spiritual, and highly developed over time. Someone used the word mature earlier this morning. This is a word that mattered to him, that things developed over time and they could reach a certain level of maturity, right, in which things worked better, right? Trial and error and experience actually does produce certain kinds of results. So in a way, the radicalism of the book, which I think reads um, as maybe differently radical in retrospect, comes from how much optimism and faith he had that Indian people, when given control over their lives, would do well and would develop new forms of tribal nationalism. It would be a model for changing contemporary social relations across the board. This is the tone and the affect as I reread the book this summer that really struck me, right? How much faith he had, how much confidence he had, but right? that this is, 
this is a critique, of course, but this is a futuristic book, right? This is a book that is looking towards things that can and do and will happen. So there's nothing crazy about this either. That same moment of the IRA and termination was one of both intense paternalism and also quietly effective tribal self-management. The possibilities for tribal, strong tribal administration were very real for him. And he was a personal admirer of many of the tribal leaders in the 1950s and 60s, who he characterized repeatedly as an excellent cohort of leaders rising to daunting challenges. So I find myself at this moment thinking in parallel about the career of his friend and ally, Suzanne Schoen Harjo, which will be celebrated next week at the National Museum of the American Indian. One thing, and I've been writing a piece on this, um, one thing that's striking about her career, and I think revealing about his, is the sheer numbers of Indian leaders with whom she partnered over the years. Right? This was and is no small closed off world, but a massive cohort of hundreds and hundreds of tribal leaders and political workers. In that context, right, which was also his context, it's not difficult at all to locate important and powerful work being um, enacted in institutional kinds of settings. Today, we often point to AIM uh, and the NIYC as high watermarks in the story of the Red Power movements. Indeed, the critique of tribal councils and the NCAI serves as something of an intellectual origin story for Red Power with NIYC as the beginning and AIM as its apotheosis. I think it's worth remembering that that is not the story in this book. As, they, as he sat down to his typewriter in 1968, those narratives had really no traction for him. The 1968 Poor People's March is front and center in his mind. The NCAI's strategic triumph over Stuart Udall's omnibus bill, obviously one of his own shining moments, offers a central linchpin that is less often remembered today. As he wrote, Alcatraz, the takeover, had not happened. It broke at almost exactly the same time the first reviews of Custer started to come in. And it's kind of uncanny, right, that the reviews were November 9th, 14th, and 18th. Um, Alcatraz, the takeover, November 20th, right? So it's all unfolding in November of 1969. So the trail of broken treaties, the takeover at Wounded Knee, those things are not quite imaginable, right, at that particular moment. And so in the book, he surveyed the landscape of Indian country, and he thought institutionally and strategically. As Robert Warrior and Paul Chat Smith recount, he would come slightly later, in 1970, to imagine a kind of plan of confederation. The NIYC would recruit, support, and train Native youth uh, to form the next cohorts of leadership. The tribal chairs organization would coordinate policy and legal strategy across tribes. The NCAI would lobby Congress and the administration, and AIM would press the cultural politics of the street. It's actually a pretty good vision for how things might have unfolded. Um, they didn't unfold that way, but not to say that it's not a good vision. So one way to trace the origins of this book in that kind of institutional political activism would be to focus in on the three years my father served as the director of the National Congress of American Indians from the fall of 1964 to the end of 1967. In Custer, he presents what he frequently offered as a standard origin story uh, for his appointment. As a scholarship recruiter, he found himself escorting a visitor around Sheridan, Wyoming during all Indian days when he wandered into the NCAI meeting um, in a moment of political struggle and uncertainty. And somehow, when the dust cleared, he was the director, the young guy that everybody thought they could push around. So Fred Hoxie and now David Martinez has pretty well dismantled that story, pointing out that my father came to Sheridan with a slogan, a platform, something of a plan, and a competitor he needed to out-debate. So here one can see a dynamic, I think, that is central to his career, right? Planning and strategy and forethought meets up with situational awareness, good timing, a certain operational political deftness, right? He was situational and he had a long-term kind of set of visions. His first months were taken up by administrative things, a power struggle with the previous director, Robert Burnett, who refused to give up the financial records and the checkbook. Um, this was a time of intense financial stress, fiscal stress for the organization. And then there was a period of learning on the job um, in which my grandfather, who had conducted a massive sociological study for the Episcopal Church in the 1950s, flying and driving to reservations around the country, played a major role with introductions um, and helping him think strategically about Indian country as a diverse whole. So I think some part of um, his training for NCAI was traveling around with my grandfather, his father, um, sort of going into the different communities, going through the churches, being there. But another part of it was drawing on what my grandfather had done as a sociologist, right? He majored in sociology, and as well as being an 
All-American um, honorable mention football player uh, in 1922. So my grandfather kind of schooled him in many ways about some of the ways to think about Indian country. And in this, interestingly, my father was also reprising the experience of his aunt, Ella Deloria, whose initial experience of ethnographic field work was deeply structured by her father's network of church and kin and the introductions that he provided um, for her. Every time I show the Deloria um, sort of men in a kind of genealogical trajectory like this, I feel it imperative to also show the women. And one of the things that's actually kind of cool is that there's a painting of my great-great-grandmother, Pehan Lutowin, done by Alfred Sully, um, who would be the sort of uh, father of her child, uh, Mary Sully, Akichi Talmin. So, um, so his institutional capital, in many ways, was administrative. Um, but it also was, at its core, based in native kinship relations and the networks established through his family and his friends. So the book bears a lot of traces of this learning, not all of which is completely Indian positive. Right? There are wry notes on the challenges and the burnout attending the NCAI director's position, frustration with the unevenness of tribal participation, observations on the predictable unpredictability of Indian politics. But the first half of the book is really, I think, razor sharp, um, as, as other folks have mentioned, as it takes critical aim at stereotyping legal and political history the government, the churches, and of course, the anthropologists. The second half is a little bit more meandering, moving through different themes, race relations and civil rights, native leadership, possible futures. These are essays, right? They are thought pieces rather than a sustained book length um, kind of argument. And indeed, it seems likely, as someone mentioned earlier, that his editor put them in the sequence that we encounter when we read the book today. But I want to pull out a couple chapters. And since Patty sort of came into this through humor, and many people have talked about humor, I want to pull out a couple of sort of hinge chapters and just sort of think on them with you for a little bit um, uh, for consideration of the legacy of Custer today. So the humor chapter, the one I liked best as a kid when the book came out, and you could sort of take it and read it as a stand-up routine, as a set of jokes, um, you know, has an important, but I think a light veneer of argument, right? You know people by their humor. Indians are not stoic people. Humor is a survival strategy. Um, and so in the, when you're reading through the book, it's easily read as the literary equivalent of sort of sitting around telling jokes, right? It could be a kind of an easy chapter. This was my experience as a young person reading it. This was the easiest chapter, the chapter I could assimilate, the legible chapter uh, for me. A kind of taking of breath as you come out of those really tough chapters in the beginning um, before launching into the rest of the book. But I don't think it's that at all, really. I've been increasingly inclined to read it as a kind of master key to a consideration of his style. And to, uh, I think, a problem that he confronted as a writer, as we all confront as a writer, which is the relationship between style and argument. Um, uh, in my father's writing, there's this tension, I think, between the two. Argument is sometimes sublimated to style, right? Sometimes his style allows him to sort of coast through arguments that might be uh, stronger. But style is oftentimes married to argument in ways that are incredibly strong and incredibly powerful, right? And like all writers, right, you don't always get it right. And so feeling the tensions between those things, to me, has been really interesting in terms of, um, terms of reading this to the book. And style, right, I also want to say, carries meaning and content in and of itself, right? Style matters. It's not just a superficial thing. So what the humor chapter suggests to me is it's not just him, that we're also talking about something larger, a kind of native sense of style which he embodied, which he sort of pulled together, and which he modeled. Um, to explore this dynamic a little bit between style and, and argument, I thought we might linger for a moment on two of the most famous passages in Custer, the introduction to the takedown chapter on anthropologists and the very first chapter, or the very first paragraph in the book. And I'll just sort of let you read these you know, quickly for a second and then talk about them quickly. It's delightful to hear you chuckling. More chuckling is good. <laughs> so uh, in, in staking my claim to be an interdisciplinary person, Patty, I'm just going to coast on that for a while, right? As an American studies person, right? Literary critical kinds of methods are interesting and important to me. Um, it's kind of one of the things that allows me to sort of Converting to an art historian with this last project, and so, um, <laughs> so I've I've just sort of tried to digest these sentences a little bit. Um, uh, 
And one of the things you can see here, this, I want to make an argument, right, that this passage, as famous as it is, is one where style sort of like doesn't actually support argument quite as well as it might, right? So we begin with this sort of general statement, in every life it is said some rain must fall. Fine, cool, this sets the parameters, what's going to happen. Then we've got a sort of couple of specific kinds of things. People have horoscopes, take sticks. Tips on the stock market, you know, a little chuckle is appropriate here. McNamara created the TFX and the Edsel. This, of course, um, is something that is very time sensitive, right? The TFX, I had to look this up, was a fighter jet that Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, was, to, was supposed to be um, uh, procured that would uh, serve all the branches of the military. And it turned out to be this huge disaster that didn't quite work. But the Edsel, <laughs> is this a, yeah, I don't know. Churches possess the real world. Interestingly, when this was published in Playboy, that sentence was moved by some copy editor or someone and replaced by, American politics has George Wallace, which has a much better rhythm and makes much more sense, right? <laughs> but then as you can see how it all comes together at the end, right? the absolute sort of incredible superlative hyperbolic claim in all of world history, right? <laughs> Indians have been cursed more than any other person. Indians have anthropologists, right? And the triviality of the anthropologist meeting the sort of hyperbolic claim is what gives it its power and its humor and its style and it's great, right? The punchline comes, right? But what we oftentimes sort of forget as we're reading this is like the setup to this, ah, it could have been better done, right? This maybe wasn't his best sort of example. Contrast that with this, which is one of my very favorite passages, a friendly opening. Hey, gentle white reader, one of the finest things about being an Indian is that people are always interested in you ah, and your plight. And of course, the framing of plight here tells us something is coming. And then this beautiful sort of setup, other groups have problems, quandaries, predicaments, et cetera, et cetera. Indians have a plight, it's set in the need of people apart, right? And it tells you there's a discursive kind of break that's going on here that he wants to pay attention to. And then, bam, this incredible, critical, sarcastic kind of sentence. Our foremost plight, like this is serious, deadly serious stuff. Our foremost plight is our transparency. People can tell just by looking at us what we want, what should be done to help us, how we feel, what a real Indian is like. This is like, for me, what captures the kind of style here. This is funny, it is smart, it is witty, it is sarcastic. It is completely and totally analytically doing things. And then he keeps going, right? Indian life as it relates to the real world is a continuous attempt not to disappoint people who know us. He's calling out to those readers. He's interpolating those readers, right? You force us to live our lives according to what you think, right? And then the killer, the kicker at the end, this does damage. This is harm. These are the hurts of history and we have suffered, right? So this is a piece of rhetoric, right? It's fantastic, right? Because it's the analysis and the wit and the humor and the irony all happen at once, right? And so much of his writing actually functions like this, right? More of it functions like this than functions like the other, such that we kind of skate by the other, because the other works okay too, right? But this is where the power lies. So the anthropology riff, famous for its frequent repub uh, republication, but perhaps less effective, relies on style. This opening, less humorous, but more devastating, makes style do the labor of argument. At work here is irony, uh, metaphor, hyperbole, inversion, along with a sense of sequence and timing and appointed politics. Read for this kind of writing across time and you can see, as my friend Beth Piatot reminds me, the same kind of scathing irony found in generations of Native American writers before, from Zik Kalashah all the way back to William Appice, reframed in Custer to articulate with the sensibilities of the 1960s reader. And so the humor chapter exemplifies and codifies native stylistic continuities, defines his own writing, and offers a contemporary model for an indigenous style of critique that subsequent generations of writers, artists, and cultural producers will emulate. All you have to do is look at cool, funny native stuff on YouTube, and you see that like the young generation has exactly the same kind of voice, scathing irony, smart analytical kinds of stuff going on. right? We should also note that Scott Mamaday was in that same instant reframing another literary style we could call this super serious indigenous modernism that would also be emulated by subsequent generations. It's why the two of them I think are so important in that moment. So irony requires intelligence and self-awareness and the conversion of deadly political and historical ironies into humor requires even something more, right? A kind of transcendent awareness.
which was exactly what my dad was trying to inculcate, uh, both a sympathetic awareness among white readers and a generative, forward-looking, meta-self-aware, intelligent sense of self right, among Indian readers and future Indian writers. That selfhood would produce new ways of thinking closely and critically tied to old ways of thinking. In that sense, he was a product of the 1960s, the groovy 60s, imagining a new age that would be built on indigenous foundations. And I just sort of point you to this. No progress has been made in developing new concepts, right, for us. The law is 40 years old, the IRA. Its ideas, adequately phrased for a depression America, cannot now express the realities of a space age Indian community. That's actually not from Custer, but I think it captures his sense that there was an intellectual and political project ahead for Native people. And damn, if that new thinking did not and has not come to pass. Well, the other hinge chapter, in my view, is the red and the black, which marks his first effort in placing Native concerns in relation to an African-American dominated civil rights movement. He felt it important to articulate a clear sense of the different histories, goals, and methods visible in these two uh, struggles for justice. And if the chapter is sometimes clunky, sometimes a bit insensitive, occasionally didactic, I think he also correctly perceived that Indian people needed to deal not only with white supremacy, but also with ways that the civil rights narrative and argument, that is, rights-based legal pacts between the individual and the state, also posed a problem for arguments based in treaties, tribal sovereignty, and collective rights. As it does so often, Custer lays down a marker for the future, one that he took up in greater and perhaps more sensitive detail in We Talk, You Listen, and then in subsequent writings. Today, as white supremacy has become a cultural currency publicly embraced by a significant sector of Americans, Native peoples face a similarly counterintuitive challenge. That is, African American histories and struggles have come often through the co-opting efforts and effects uh, of white liberalism to stand for all histories of racial oppression and thus threaten to erase distinctive indigenous histories and claims, even as they rightly demand a national accounting on their own terms, of which we can be wholly and completely supportive. A more specific origin story for Custer might begin with a 1967 book by Stan Steiner, The New Indians, was billed as a translation of young native activist philosophy to the white mainstream. Steiner featured a particularly verbal group along with Vine Deloria, Clyde Warrior, Mel Tom, Herbert Blatchford, Annie Wanecka, Shirley Hill Witt, Roger Jordade, Willie Hensley, Mary Lou Payne, and of course, Bob Thomas. New York publishers, scenting a market and aided by Steiner, recruited a number of these intellectuals to write books. My father was actually able to make it happen, although I think not so easily. He had a $500 advance from Macmillan Publishers, and after three months and two laborious chapters, he flew back to New York with a check for the advance money in his pocket, convinced that the writing was no good and wanting to forestall the inevitable rejection. To his surprise, his editor liked it and pulled out a copy-edited page from one of Norman Mailer's manuscripts. It was covered with red ink. To the extent that my father realized that, as he often, as he said, you know, with, with great delight, Mailer only half wrote his own prose. <laughs> hmm. Uh, and that there was both editorial help and copy editing ahead for him as well. He told me about this mailer page uh, a couple of times when I was in graduate school and struggling to write long form um, argument always with great, great delight. Uh, according to my mom, after that New York meeting, he relaxed and he began a much quicker pace of writing. And we can think of this, as we also heard this morning, as something of an NCAI book, right, in both style and content. Custer's chapters organized and arranged many of the familiar speaking points and talk tracks that he had developed as the director. My mom's memories of the actual writing process, and I had a delightful time this summer sort of sitting down and having, I don't know, five or six hour conversation with my mom about the writing of Custer and how it all sort of went down from her, you know, from her memory. So her memories of the actual writing process are that he didn't really need to do extensive research for this book. Um, and I want to just emphasize that because he actually did a lot of research on a lot of other books. But that here, he sat down in the evening after we'd all gone to bed and just kind of let it rip. So my grandparents were, were poor or poorer people in the sort of genteel way of the chronically underpaid native rural clergy of the Episcopal Church, 
um, who failed to build wealth, unable to build wealth during the Depression, and then came with too little too late during the post-war years. I was able to watch my parents climb over the course of my own life from this kind of intellectual working poor where they started into the upper middle class. When he wrote Custer, we lived in an 800 square foot house at 2440 South Monroe Street in Denver, Colorado. I was tempted to drive by it yesterday, actually. It's kind of by DU. I actually went to uh, University Park Elementary School and it's in walking distance up there. Um, my brother and I shared a pastor room to my parents' tiny, tiny bedroom. My sister's crib was kind of Harry Potter-esque in a kind of a closet -y thing. Uh, and there was a tiny little kitchen uh, in the equally small living room that was the only place my dad had to write. So this began his lifelong habit of sitting, of writing, sitting cross-legged in an easy chair with the typewriter set on a coffee table which eventually helped destroy his back. I mean, if you imagine the kind of leaning over you would have to do with that. And of course, nobody slept in this house because everyone could hear the, everyone could hear the typewriter clacking away um, all night. And then my dad would drive up to Boulder for law classes during the day, study, um, and I hate to say it, but like he was not a super studious student, as he oftentimes confessed, um, but he would study a bit, not a lot, and then write, go back and write all night. Um, um, as I've suggested, the book reveals um, a relative beginner struggling to learn the craft. It's at its best when you can hear the oral in the written language. That is when the writing reflects his everyday speech patterns. And oftentimes that means the funny, ironic, sarcastic bits because this was the world in which he operated verbally. It's perhaps not at its best when he's still in his thinking language, right? Not quite practiced or fully confident of what he was trying to say. Churches have the real world. Or did he really mean that the tribe and the corporation were close echoes of one another, right? It, it reads uncertainly or perhaps half-bakedly um, a bit today. The black and the red chapter, in my view, shows him uncomfortable in his own skin when writing about the larger parameters of race and racial formation. In various chapters, you can also see the early thinking for books later to come. The chapter on treaties clearly presaged the later book, Behind the Trail of Broken Treaties, his musings on religion, which are found throughout the text, foreshadow God is read and the metaphysics of modern existence. And in that sense, Custer can be um, sometimes read as an imperfect first draft right, for the career with deeper thinking and more substantive writing yet to come. He was lucky with Macmillan as his press and I think especially with the book jacket. We were just chatting about the book jacket uh, a minute ago. Um, and, and so I'm going to show you not the red Oklahoma version, right, but the green Macmillan version, which features this scary dead-eyed eagle holding a tomahawk in its beak. And notice where the color actually comes in here and the handle of the tomahawk and the kind of tie-dye thing on the, on the blade. The design of this was by a guy named Jason McWhorter. Um, I got, this is a little bit of a sidebar, a little bracket, but I just got curious about it, right? He was a designer with the Pushpin Studios, which was the definitive studio in New York for 20 years between the mid-1950s and the 70s and then actually beyond. And McWhorter was one of a sort of number, a number of these sort of young guns in the studio graduating from the School of Visual Arts. One of my dad's happiest moments around this book was getting a letter from some native soldiers in Vietnam who had taken the eagle with the tomahawk and made it into a patch for their flight jackets. And they'd sent him a couple of them. And he just, like, this was so emotional and important and meaningful uh, uh, to him. Um, so what's interesting, I think, is... Um, some of the ways that this reflects this kind of late 60s design kind of thing. Here you can see a textual conversation going on between McWhorter and his boss, who was the cutting edge designer, Milton Glazer. First of all, then uh, partnering together on Jacob Javits, uh, Javits campaign buttons. And then McWhorter, clearly going back to Glazer's 1967 design, this is the middle um, panel, uh, for the cover of We Talk, You Listen over on the right hand side. Both covers reflect pushpins place, and here's the Life magazine. Like, this is as 60s as it gets, right? Um, they reflect Pushpin's place as a design innovator, um, rejecting the narrative tradition of design, um, think Norman Rockwell kind of stuff, and focused instead on communicating concepts and ideas, often through a kind of surreal pop art backed by ver uh, research into visual archives. Um, and, you know, you can see this when they take this visual kind of this photograph and they put it over this, uh, you know, kind of 60s kind of psychedelic thing. So both of these covers, I think, are fantastic examples of this. Um, and I think he was well served, right, Mac Mac Macmillan, Macmillan in this sense. And at this point, I want to do a quick shout out also. Oops, maybe I don't. It's later, sorry. Um, 
It is also worth noting, and going back to this question, that Macmillan's publicity machine also did a really good job with this book. Um, my understanding is that they were the ones who placed the anthropology chapter um, in Playboy. They helped get pieces in the New York Times, New York Times Magazine. Um, they uh, really pushed all those reviews. They had been cultivating Pete Hamill to sort of embrace this book for a couple of months, apparently, before it, uh, before it even came out. So, um, so here's the Playboy um, uh, Magazine. Um, if Rob Williams was here, he does this kind of hysterical riff, right, where he pulls out a sort of medicine bag and he pulls out the sacred object, which is the Playboy magazine. Um, <laughs> but I think I just want to sort of second what Robert said earlier, right, that Playboy was at this moment a place where um, some pretty intense political writing actually took place. Uh, this 1965 interview with Martin Luther King goes on for pages and pages and pages. Um, I actually highly commend it to anyone who's interested in, King, in King's legacy. It is incredibly revealing. Um, and King speaks extemporaneously on this. These Playboy interviews apparently you know, would, would take place over the course of two or three or four days to the point where like, what they said is that um, uh, they want to break down the subject past all of the obvious things that they say and then get them to say other kinds of things which are actually more interesting. Um, so you can see this is just a very partial list. Even in this issue, there's an incredible um, uh, interview with Ramsey Clark, who's the attorney general at the time. Um, and I'll just sort of quickly say my only, you know, as a sort of kid, when did you sort of first find Playboy? Well, I, for me, it was my neighbor, the Smiths family, um, and Buck's, my neighbor, Buck Smith, right, who lived just down the way from 2440 South Ivanhoe, or South Monroe Street. Working class guy, he worked on the line at Coors Brewery, um, subscribed to Playboy, um, looked at the pictures, um, but... <laughs> I also, at various times, saw him reading the articles. And so that familiar joke, I just get it for the articles, maybe <laughs> turns out to be true and actually maybe reaches a somewhat different audience than we might even begin to imagine. I, I don't know how far down the road I want to get with that. Um, <laughs> you know, um, because it, this is one of these deals, right, where that thing which is hegemonic is also counter-hegemonic. That thing which is counter-hegemonic is also hegemonic, right? And I don't want to sort of displace the kind of uh, gender violence that actually Playboy also represents, right? So I think it's important to sort of put those things in the complex sort of um, context. So once he finished Custer, he never looked back. We moved to a slightly larger house where he assembled a working office in the basement. My mom and sister uh, got to sleep upstairs, but the office was right behind the basement room my brother and I shared. And so we listened as over time he developed a writer's routine. Big cup of cold coffee, leftover from the morning, cigarettes, an hour worth of, uh, hour's worth of solitaire with the occasional curse and shuffle as he kind of organized his thinking before touching the typewriter and IBM Selectric. Um, a writing dog at his feet. Uh, yeah, first uh, Just Dog, JD, then Harper, then New Dog. We were really imaginative about our dog names. Um, then Marlo, uh, and then finally, uh, finally Bob, the, his last writing dog. Later would come the stereo with old country songs from his youth cycling over and over again. And I do mean over and over and <laughs> over and over again. Many nights I spent listening to uh, They Say Don't Go Woo -hoo, on Wolverton Mountain. <laughs> and then the song finished and you think, oh, thank God that's over. And then there we go again. They Say Don't Go Woo -hoo. <clears throat> Why he did this, I don't know, um, but he did. So he churned out We Talk You Listen assembled a primary source collection of utmost good faith, wrote God is Red and several others, Indians of the Pacific Northwest, a kind of regional case study, and a short church-focused paperback, The Indian Affair. He did curious projects like a revision of Jennings Wise's Red Man in the New World Drama and important books like Behind the Trail of Broken Treaties, not that these others aren't also important, by the late 1970s, which he capped off with the metaphysics of modern existence. He had cranked out more books in a decade than most writers do over a full career. And now I want to do a shout out to Fulcrum Press, right, which has been really the sort of press that has taken my dad's legacy in writing and really, really done a fantastic job. Bob, are you here? Thank you. Thank you. And it ties back to the covers because Fulcrum never fails to have an amazing cover right, on these books. They're just beautiful, beautiful books. And uh, I think we can all be grateful. <laughs>
So over those years, he grew confident as a writer, though it was perhaps a more fragile thing than he let on. And Robert, here I think you and I are, can be in an interesting kind of dialogue on this. He felt he couldn't get comfortable writing in Arizona, where my parents moved in 1978. He sometimes worried about whether Scott Mamaday respected him as a writer. He struggled through three drafts to finish his book on Carl Jung. These are the kinds of worries that I think confront all writers. Um, but there was also a heady and wonderful moment in the beginning when Custer defined him anew as a writer. In an autobiographical fragment, he talks about finding his way to the Lion's Head Bar in New York City shortly after Custer and being embraced by a set of writers who occupied the place, David Markson, Joel Oppenheimer, and others. So here he is sort of talking about his first night coming into the, the Lion's Head, and I'll just let you read. So on this magical first night, uh, he stays on after Pete Hamill leaves. The poet and village voice calmness, Joel Oppenheimer, comes in, and they talk for a while. Then they walk over to uh, Oppenheimer's apartment so my dad can off, uh, autograph his copy of Custer. Then they come back to the lion's head, and the night shift is arriving. And this is what he said over and over again, right? The topics would switch from one illusion to another as fast as people could get the crypts out. This was apparently this sort of moment of just smart people back and forthing constantly. <laughs> and it's no coincidence, I think, Robert, that he met you there, right? Because as he then later on to, went on to sort of recollect, the head became an obsession to me. I would hit New York City and get to the Tudor Hotel, tip the bellboy. Um, we did a lot of behind the scenes work at the, at the lion's head. Um, <clears throat> and Hamill also talks about the lion's head, but so does David Markson in an interesting kind of thing and talks about my dad being at the, um, at the lion's head and how much he loved it. And Markson says something like, yeah, I don't think Vine Deloria ever came to New York City without going straight to the lion's head. Um, and there's many other things, great stories that come out of this fantastic jokes and wonderful things. As I was making my way through the, my 20s, my dad always told me this, Deloria men, don't figure out their lives until they're about 30. He says, it seems like we're treading water, just drifting around, but it will all come together. So he was 29 or so when he started his first job in Indian country for Betty Rosenthal and Tilly Walker at the United Scholarship Service, 31 when he became director of NCAI, and 36 when Custer came out. And so it's a bit emotional for me to read these autobiographical pages, 10 or so of them inspired by the closing of the lion's head and the selling off of all the framed memorabilia that was, uh, that was there. Um, and sort of think back to him as a younger man, right? Imagine him in that moment when Custer not only opened up a way for him in Indian affairs, but also as a writer, I think, in the wider world of American letters and the ways that he enjoyed and loved and embraced that. These were moments of him, for him, of really coming together. And so his final reminiscence on this is just, I think, worth pausing on, and then I'll move towards a conclusion. So in many ways, Custer died for your sins was also a justification for him leaving the National Congress of American Indians. And he concludes the book with another one of these sort of just so stories. If he was just wandering aimlessly around the convention in 1964, in 1968, he was suddenly struck by the need for lawyers. The University of Colorado Law School was uh, inspiration and grounding for him, but also perhaps a form of refuge. He clearly saw Custer as a book that burned a few bridges, as I think we've talked a little bit about earlier. Writing this book as I have, he said, has placed me in a certain position in Indian affairs, which unfortunately I shall not be able to retreat, at least not very soon. One reason I wanted to write it was to raise some issues for younger Indians, which they have not been raising for themselves. Another reason was to give some idea to white people of the unspoken but often felt antagonisms I've detected in Indian people toward them and the reasons for such antagonisms. So here again is the double-edged critique for which he was so well known, deeply hostile to the American institutions that he targeted so specifically, while at the same time questioning the strategies of the young militants and pushing for his version of tribal nationalism. By 1974, the militants, not so much younger than he was, had had their moment. In a way, they'd responded to his critique, linking up with the traditionalists for whom he had the greatest respect. You could also argue that those activists clearly revealed to him the failures of the tribal administrations in which he put such faith. In another way, the Amsters had confirmed his fears and predictions that militancy might jumpstart a new politics, but would it be able to sustain 
elastic movement. And finally, he felt confirmed in his belief that a steady but aggressively bold work in law and policy, militant in its own way, I think, offered the best path forward through the confusing landscape of the 1970s, perhaps best exemplified by the resurgence of the NCAI, the rise of organizations like the Native American Rights Fund, and new legal cases, laws, administrative rulings, and challenges. That's one important message of Behind the Trail of Broken Treaties, which was his last major piece of Indian writing for some years, the conclusion of what David Martinez in his new biography calls the Deloria Tetralogy, Custer, We Talk, God is Read, and Behind the Trail of Broken Treaties, a kind of explosion of writing in the five-year period between 1969 and 1974. One might actually expand that canon to a hexology or even a heptology. I had to look up those things which have <laughs> sixes and sevens in them of writing inescapably linked to Custer. I haven't often gone back uh, to Redman or to Of Utmost Good Faith, 1971, but when I do, I'm struck by several things. Superficially, it's the kind of document collection that a just finished law school student might put together. But it turns out it's much more than that with close study. Um, it's worth returning to the framing that he put around each one of these excerpts, which is not simply a kind of standard paragraph introduction, right? But often an impassioned plea to pay attention to history and to learn followed in many cases by a smart and pointed interpretive conclusion. The final sections on Indian leadership and dealing with Indians are as contemporary as Custer and just as powerful, especially in his elevation of the voices of Joe Gary, the Fort Berthold Tribal Council, Earl Oldperson, and Robert Lewis. And it's also worth noting that the publisher, Straight Arrow Press, chose to release it in both hardback and paper with a trade press cover aimed at a popular audience. And that tells you, I think, about the impact of Custer, that a document collection might actually masquerade as a trade book in this case. Then there's the curious case of his rewriting of Jennings Wise's Red Man in the New World Drama, an obscure book published in 1931 that had never become and is still not part of the canon of writing about Indian issues. Why care about this book? This was, has been fundamentally mysterious to me. But here, too, I think we can turn back to Custer for some speculative insights. Throughout his writing career, my dad always understood that the root of political and legal change lay in cultural attitudes. Ironically, an anthropological position, perhaps drawn from his Aunt Ella, who I think it's safe to argue was highly sensitized to cultural politics. And so, as we've also heard this morning, Custer and We Talk, You Listen both begin with a critique, not simply of stereotypes, but of the master narratives that cling to Indian people that underpin American's sense of itself. The somewhat stodgy, actually quite stodgy language of Red Man and the New World Drama offered him something interesting and important. Not a critique, right, he'd already done that, but another counter-narrative that consistently centered Indian agency and revealed colonial dominations, cheats, lies, and brutality. It's in the tradition of Helen Hunt Jackson, perhaps, or Dee Brown, and I'm not sure how well you can see this, but it starts at the very beginning. It starts with uh, the, you know, Norse, and it ends with the, uh, the present moment. So it is a long and deep kind of, um, kind of history. So if Buried My Heart at Wounded Knee, uh, published in 1970, had not become a bestseller, imagine this as a counterfactual with me, then perhaps this longer history might have become a bestseller and done some important cultural work, offering white readers an indigenous counter-narrative of great time depth and polemical power. So what if this had seized the market in 1971? Finally, uh, there's the treaty book project that he did under the auspices of the Institute for the Development of Indian Law, in which he printed collections of treaties tribe by tribe so that lots of tribal members could have quick access to their treaties. These were the books that my brother and I painstakingly collated in our basement because to save money, my dad had them printed but not collated or bound. And so we had hundreds of boxes of treaty texts uh, and spent each, uh, at least a year assembling them book by book by book. This was our contribution to the cause. He paid us a nickel apiece. <laughs> so as we celebrate Custer at 50, it is perhaps worth remembering it both as a great world historical landmark book and as an imperfect first effort on the part of someone who would continue to grow as a writer and as a scholar. For my grad students who tend to look on Vine Deloria as a kind of effortless genius fully formed, I think that's an important and comforting kind of idea, and all the better for being true. It's also clear that Custer Died for Your Sins needs to be seen as an introduction and master key to a tremendously full body of work, tetralogy or heptology as you choose, constituted over only five or six years that would form the core of ideas further developed over the course of a long career. 
Vindeloria would shed the sketchy or the impractical in this uh, sort of scholarly endeavor, this writing endeavor, even as he refined and elaborated the ideas of self-determination and sovereignty that spoke powerfully to the post-1960s moment and into our present. I think it's important then to see Custer not only in terms of his famous books, but also the ones now fallen just a bit by the wayside, to say nothing, as Robert has um, cautioned us or sort of asked ask us to think about, all the articles, reviews, introductions, the whole body of this other work, which is extraordinary. These things show us that Custer was not only a singular intellectual object, but also part of a broader effort to build new oppositional master narratives and to create legal and political thought structures for both Indians and non-Indians. I've also tried at least a bit uh, to personalize the book in its processes. It matters to me how these kinds of texts get written, that there's trial or error, that there is work, there are missteps, plans, unexpected contingencies. It matters that my dad was attending law school and writing at night, or that he had a thing about music. And I want to sort of share these pictures with you of the young Vine Deloria with his guitar, sort of. So he did have a thing about music, which was visible in his willingness to turn Custer into a record, but only if Floyd Westerman got to be the artist. Uh, and for those of you who don't know this album, it's really good, and it holds up over time. And the song Custer Died for Your Sins really is a great song, and it shows off Floyd right, as, a, as a really excellent singer. And Rick Williams and I were talking about this nice, last night, his ability to go, Custer died for your sins, and then go up a little bit, Custer died for your sins, a new day must begin. And then he goes like this, Custer died. <laughs> And it is so low, it's like underwater, and it's this gravelly, rangy, beautiful, beautiful thing. I commend it to you. These things matter. It matters that he was, uh, and also I just have to show you his favorite picture of himself in this regard, right? Yes, holding Jerry Jeff Walker's guitar. It matters that he was both a serious man and a pranking trickster that he was a risk taker willing to experiment and adventure, that he had his networks of friends, commitments to Indian country, dogs, family, student, colleagues, readers, all of these different kinds of things. Um, all these folks, here's Bob the dog, here he is at Convocation of Faith. Um, his good friend Bobby Bridger, Floyd. Um, here he is being the master of ceremonies at a music festival at Winter Park. Um, he, was, he was a risk taker, right? He was a guy who was willing to do, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, but he did. So it's easy to look at this book and all the other books uh, from a distance and assume that he had some kind of master plan. I don't think he did, or I don't think he had much of one. Custer was responsive to its moment and its context. And as is so often the case, it was in the act of writing itself that he started to see the lines and directions, the threads and webs, the possibilities and dead ends that would come to make up the body of work first constituted between 1969 and 74, and that would be pursued over the course of his career and would, 50 years later, take on a kind of visible thematic coherence and consistency that has made him one of the most important native intellectuals of the 20th century, with an echo and an impact and words, living words, that carry strongly into our own moment. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry for going going over, oh, but, but, but I'm sorry. Don't, no, sorry. Nope. Uh, Professor Gomez, we're delighted <laughs> that you could join us. <laughs> I didn't need to do that. I'm sorry. Professor Deloria <laughs> at Harvard, where you may assign Custer died for your sins, but don't expect that would be appreciated by the author. Uh, that was remarkable. That was absolutely wonderful, and I thank you very much for that.